Metal Gear Rising Revengeance has recently blown up in popularity, and the last time I touched this game was when my gamertag picture looked like this, Xboxes still had P90 mags for hard drives, and you could tell the difference between purchasing a video game or an insurance plan. While the world was too busy being distracted by real life NPCs, I decided to grab the game on Steam for practically free, and it didn't take long before I realized that Platinum Games created nothing short of a masterpiece. I'm not even yanking on your foreskin. The entire package this game offers slaps harder than my stepdad in a drunken rage, and Platinum Games have provided nothing but a meditative experience that everyone should try at least once. As most of us know, on this channel we like to speedrun my misfortune to provide happiness directly to the viewers' retinas, so let's provide the content that you all came here for. Now, with 30% more democracy per death. Can you beat Metal Gear Rising Revengeance without taking damage? The challenge in this video isn't necessarily organic. In fact, it's very doable, and the answer is yes. MGR actually has an achievement for beating each of the main story bosses without taking any damage on hard difficulty. This is a feat within itself, and shout out to all the Sigma gamers and their adamantium testicles for accomplishing such a daunting task. But is it possible to beat the entire game without taking any damage on a brand new save and without using weapons such as Sam's Murasama? As with the rest of my no damage runs, the rules here are simple. If I take any bit of damage, I must reload from the most recent checkpoint and restart the section once again. Will I be able to find a way around the force damage sections of this run? Is it possible to topple Armstrong's metal gear without getting my asshole triple pile drivered? Well, go ahead and grab your wonder ball, sit back in your hotel cup chair, and prepare to watch your boy get tortured in a video game, as class is now in session, and I'm bringing out the TV cart for this one. For those of you that aren't very familiar with Metal Gear lore, don't worry. As always, I have your back. Based on a loose depiction of our potential future, the world of Metal Gear is brutal. So brutal that becoming a twink military grade cyborg and selling your children to commission more Resident Evil 4 big busty Ashley mods are a common practice. In this game, you play as the world renowned bodyguard Jack the Ripper, aka Mr. Lightning Bolt. And in it, we experience his incredibly wholesome journey where he saves those children and climbs the political ladder to face the very first Elden Lord, Senator Armstrong. Strong. Currently, he is tasked with protecting the Prime Minister of Sugma. Now, you may be asking if the province of Sugma is canon to Metal Gear lore. That is a great question, and according to my sources, the answer is yes, and it's located directly south of Ligma Ball. Everything was going as planned. That is until this quirked up Spanish lad that was seemingly goaded with the sauce showed up and ignored the Geneva Convention by instead making a Geneva suggestion that breathing was no longer a privilege we deserved. This cyborg's ulterior motives were about as clear as censored hentai, but what was clear was that it was time for Jack to take matters into his own hands. Our bread and butter this challenge run is the ability to block and parry. Blocking completely deflects any damage, and parrying does the same, but if timed correctly, allows you to do an empowering attack. Seeing as this was the first time I touched this game in over 8 years, I went through a quick training arc that involved 14 resets and then remembered that Rising Revengeance has one of the best mechanics I have ever seen in a video game. For all of my dopaminergic viewers out there, this is Blade Mode, a mechanic that gives you the surgical precision to castrate the common flea and lets you play Fruit Ninja with your enemy's limbs. Platinum Games seemingly worked with distinguished scientists around the globe to produce a gameplay mechanic that absolutely Batista bombs your dopamine dispensers. Blade Mode is a persuasive technique that doubles as an execute, and just in case you didn't get a Jimmy Neutron brain blast from that information, I'll help you out. These abilities are imperative to a no damage run, so mastering them is a must. The Prime Minister needed saving, so I ran past the other enemies, effectively turned offense into the opposite of offense, witnessed one of the Prime Minister's personal bodyguards lose a game of rock, paper, scissors, and was immediately raw dogged with the truth that there was nothing I could do about this kidnapping. The CEO of one of the best soundtracks in this game escaped with the Prime Minister, and here I was, left to fight what looks to be the final boss of this game, a multi-billion dollar death robot that was built to make my insides outsides. 
Now, you would think that this is where the combat really cranks it up, but thanks to the training arc that I went through earlier, this Metal Gear didn't stand a chance. Within two resets, I discovered that you can actually block its stomp attacks, allowing you to be an absolute menace to this poor thing and its ankles. Thanks to Ninja Run, I was able to deflect any projectiles that came my way, and with that combo, all you had to do is chase it around and make sure your blocks were well-timed. After the trash was taken care of, it was time to locate our client. The chase lasted about as long as you would expect, before we would once again find ourselves between a rock and a hard cock. Dissecting the Metal Gear's cheeks wasn't enough to put it out of commission, so it was time to tussle with it once again. Round 2 didn't go as smoothly as I would have hoped. The Metal Gear now had a different moveset, his preferred move being colonic thermotherapy via explosive missiles. All it took was me overcoming my brain rot, practicing my platforming skills, and listening to the you game's f***ing dialogue to silence this thing. You my god, I'm a f***ing buffoon. He literally tells you to use blade mode. This most definitely wasn't my proudest moment, but at least it's not as bad as when I found out that my PS2 needed a memory card, and you can actually save your games. As compensation for toppling this beast, my ears were rewarded with an absolute boner rocking track from the OST. I completely forgot that this happens. God, I love this game. So f***ing cool. We're on the bell tower, holy shit. <laughs> this is the greatest game of all time, and I think we can all safely agree that Raiden is from the Sigmaverse, right up there next to Kratos, the Doom Slayer, Master Chief, and many others. If you ever doubted that, then this footage here should prove you otherwise. Raiden confronted the goons that ruined this fine day, and within a moment's notice, they smoked Mr. Barack Obanga. The Prime Minister of Sugma and beloved CEO of Thug Shaker was executed in cold blood. Cyborg Mr. Clean was quick to use an escape rope, and all that was left was Sam, making this a good old-fashioned 1v1. Jetstream Sam was not only blessed with the ability to ruin this video, but was also built like a rear-loading garbage truck. If you were to ask any professional, they would likely let you know that this is what a max prestige, all camos unlocked ass would look like. Now, we shouldn't let Sam's posterior dimensions distract us from the fact that you won't last 24 minutes and 34 seconds playing through this challenge, because technically, that is all it took to fail this no damage run. To quote Benny from Fallout New Vegas, the game was rigged from the start. Even playing at your absolute best, you do not have a chance. Through empirical evidence and some minor internet research, I came to the hypothesis that all of my efforts were useless, as Sam Kung Fu grips Raiden's dick and rips it right off, no matter what you do. So even though you technically can't beat this game without taking any damage, I think it's fair to exclude this single fight. If you're unhappy with this decision, then I don't know. Go down into the comment section and tell me I'm a stupid idiot, or that you hope my finger breaks through the toilet paper the next time I wipe or something. Sam did a respectable job at tearing my ass up, and not even a Spongebob Band-Aid or a Flintstones vitamin could get us out of this pickle. It was time for Raiden to finally learn one of the rules of nature, but in just the nick of time, Jack was saved, and this was where our crusade truly began. In order to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with these cybernetic hemorrhoids and their enhancements, Raiden was going to have to dip his toesies into some of that sweet, sweet family-friendly depravity. Fast forward three weeks later, he was reconstructed into the warlord he was born to be. With this new body, ripping straight-up dick was now a specialty Raiden excelled at. This man f***ed, and yes, yes, much like my Shrek Crocs, the enhancements all stayed on during sex. Raiden was here to hunt down the group Desperado, responsible for executing the Prime Minister, and thanks to Amazon Prime same-day delivery, Raiden arrived, and it was in his moral obligation to be an absolute turbo chad, and excise these malignant tumors with his blade. Doctor let us know that in order to maintain our godlike physique, we would have to consume the Halo 3 Mountain Dew game fuel located in the spines of our enemies, and these spines here were what fueled Raiden Sharangan. In a typical playthrough of this game, this mechanic is very important to your survival. Although the health bump is about as useful to me this run as Slippy is from Star Fox, the spines also replenished my energy, which is what gave me access to blade mode and even more executions. Hospitality wasn't a word in these residents' vocabulary, and I was humbled real quick after being slapped around by basic enemies. But this 
was a blessing, because I quickly learned of a technique that would make dealing with these foot soldiers a breeze. With the combination of ninja run and a quick slide into their ankles, I was able to easily simulate their critteris, making them a one-shot kill. Following a few games of Fruit Ninja, a new enemy was thrown into the mix in an effort to postpone my crusade. This was the Gecko, and it was made to turn this challenge run into a survival horror game thanks to their ability to grapple. I was a little overwhelmed at first, but within a few resets I discovered that one well-timed block was all it took to send it to God. The rest of the herd didn't stand a chance, and after winning a Darwin Award when I discovered what the usable button was, it was time for my first real boss fight, Blade Wolf. This here fight alone only took around 5% of this challenge run's completion time, but made up around 100% of my unhappiness. In this episode of Senza's Therapeutic Misadventures, we are going to attempt to take down this autonomous robo-dog without taking damage, all at the insignificant cost of my own sanity. I'll just go ahead and crack open this can of swamp ass and give it to you cold. I finally found out what the dog was doing, and what it was doing was jackhammering my coochie into oblivion. I graciously accepted the large amount of ass beatings I received, because if I were to persevere throughout this challenge, I needed all of the experience I could get. Once I learned both phases of this fight, which involved fighting the enemies I fought for the past three hours, it wasn't long until I had the perfect run. Blade Wolf was bested within 62 tries, and our first boss was done for. In an effort to strike fear into Raiden's heart, a helicopter and a new flavor of enemy was deployed to make my life a little more difficult. Subsequently, Raiden's katana was rated E for everyone, and it didn't take long for them to figure that one out. I obtained the hands needed to enter the terrorist compound, had a few resets getting to my objective due to unlucky circumstances and a few geckos that caught me with my pants down, watched Raiden catch the vicious disease known as Down Bad, and then fought my way through a warehouse to locate her. Mistral only had two moods, Twitch streamer E-Girl and Cheek Divider. If you're curious, the latter seemed the most prominent. The good news is, the devs give you the luxury of getting your ass beat to this ear-banging track. The bad news, make sure to give a quick prayer to your analog sticks, because Mistral's sentient tumors will be their boogeyman. In her second phase, hitting perfect counters and destroying her tumors were imperative for a victory, as not doing so could make the fight incredibly overwhelming. Once I decided that my testicles met their yearly quota of getting stepped on, I made sure to stick to my plan, and right before I finally achieved achieved my victory, I was blue balled, suffering a fate worse than death. Many of you may be thinking that the fate in question would be playing Gollum for 89 hours straight with no breaks, but no. It's having your game crash when you're about to kill a boss in a no damage run, forcing you to restart the entire fight. It fucking crashed and now it's making me restart. <laughs> you I'll hit you with some Raven Simone shit and spoil the future. Things are going to get a lot uglier than this. But nothing felt as bad as having to restart this entire fight one attack away from victory. I bested Mistral being the aggressive gaming athlete and warlord that I was within 32 tries, Raiden decided that women weren't for him, and then the factory was blown up thanks to one of Mistral's top donors. Dalsaiv truly had the spot of biggest D. Many of my OG viewers are probably wondering where this video's plan is, but besides telling you to just get good and not get hit, I'm not too sure what other tips I could give you. So instead, I'm going to use this time to tell you that you're a great person that most definitely puts their shopping cart away instead of leaving it in the middle of the road and chill a little bit so I could pay off some student debt. Attention all gamers and troglodytes. While watching this video, there is a very high possibility that you too may have caught the down bad disease after viewing the footage of Sam and or Dommy Mommy Mistral. We all know the only thing as bad as your calculator history is your internet history. And I suggest you stop raw dogging your browser while conducting your empirical research and start doing so protected. Thankfully, ExpressVPN has your back. The application reroutes all of your traffic through their encrypted servers so that your internet provider or Wi-Fi operator, whether that's your mom, dad, girlfriend, or workplace, can't see what you're doing online. Not only that, it also hides your IP from any troglodyte that may be interested in using it maliciously, whether that would be any government body or wannabe hacker. 
Perhaps researching Rule 34 isn't necessarily your cup of semen. Well, with one tap of a button, ExpressVPN's app could transfer you anywhere. You would and as far as the internet can tell, that single click can make you an individual from any of the 94 plus countries you are interested in choosing from. Unfortunately, Netflix's library is vastly different from country to country. So say you're a big fan of One Piece and their female characters with ridiculous anterior dimensions. In America, you cannot fully catch up with the series, but thanks to the simple click of a button, you can now indulge in the full 37 seasons of the anime. I use ExpressVPN often, and I fully endorse their product. Not only is it awesome to be working with a product that I respect, but also I would like to thank them for being one of the few companies that can put up with my verbal diarrhea and give my channel a sponsorship. I would love for you to find out how you can get three months of protection for free by visiting expressvpn.com slash Senza or using my link in the description below. Thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video and let's get back to Paddington Adventures in London. After being baptized in the diarrhea avalanche that was the Mistral fight and my game crashing, it was time to continue this crusade. Since Raiden was over here with his ass out conquering the world and putting in a name for himself, a disguise was mandatory. It wasn't as good as Scooby-Doo's disguise when they managed to sneak him on a plane, but it was damn near close. And thanks to the Doctor, we now had a military cyborg robo-dog that just so happened to be really good at helping people resolve any trauma they have been through with violence. Once we were in the sewers, I was informed of Desperado's collusion with the cartel. But before Raiden could discipline these man-children with a good spanking, we needed to locate the entrance to the Desperado research facility. During our search, we were ambushed by unmanned gears that had legitimately returned to Monkey. I quickly learned his attacks and turned him into scrap metal. The rest of his buddies suffered the same fate as I took them out using methods deemed acceptable by Big Boss's standards. And then we pushed forward until we found a settlement in need of assistance. Fighting two new unmanned gears back to back had me limit testing my sanity, especially since I had to fight three of them and they had no problem working together on this gangbang. I spent around 24 minutes here getting blasted by these things until I decided that enough was enough and it was time to throw some wrinkles onto my smooth brain. There are items in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance that can be used against your enemies to assist you in combat, an important one being the erotic shock therapy grenade. This device renders electronics temporarily useless, giving you a short window to go absolutely wacky with your katana. I spoke with the kid those unmanned gears were after, and aside from his terribly fake accent that sounded like a 45 year old man trying really hard to be a 12 year old in ape george like georgetown george and just like all damn america president he filled me in on how i could penetrate the desperado compound we were looking for i made my way inside ended up resetting thanks to a struggle snuggle fought a new enemy took damage 46 times found out that Desperado was trafficking these children to turn them into child soldiers, and then cosplayed as one of Mistral's tumors to get behind enemy lines. Cyborg Mr. Clean's identity was revealed as Sundowner, the de facto leader of Desperado, and he was accompanied by a sus benefactor whose face we didn't get to see. Finally, getting Goatseed with some good information was huge, but before we could start piecing together this puzzle, there were children in need of saving. Thanks to an undying obligation to bless this video with more content for you viewers, Desperado created this twisted metal type beat of a vehicle to stop Raiden from getting to those children. There is a lot I can say about this fight, but it turns out that I'm just a goofy goober. At the beginning of my tussle with Grad, it didn't come across my mind to attempt to block its attacks, but undermining Raiden's ability to conquer is a travesty beyond epic proportions, worse than the greatest modern travesty to befall gaming, which is not being able to buy your favorite VTuber skin in Fortnite. So according to the timestamps of my footage, I spent around 19 minutes stubbornly running around in circles, deflecting the sea of bullets grad shot my way and getting a few light attacks in whenever I could. If it wasn't obvious, attempting to tackle grad this way is equivalent to smashing your testicles in a waffle iron and turning it on. So again, don't be like me. The only thing causing me much of a problem now were its missiles. Blade mode could be used to destroy them, but I found being fast as f**k boy a more viable option. Victory came and so did I within three tries. 
We found the laboratory where the unapologetic bad guys and their shenanigans were taking place. Raiden was confronted by the first human ever in history to commit war crimes by merely breathing. And then George came in clutch as Raiden did what he did best, creating Texas-sized anatomical problems for his victims. Senor Revengeance's boner for justice and constant longing for purpose won't ever be made flaccid. So with the info that the PMC Group World Marshal was involved in this heinous child trafficking plot, he made haste to their headquarters in Denver, Colorado to set things right. Not even five minutes into our dive, we enjoyed the American privilege of being shot by police officers and thus began our rampage in the streets of Denver. It was clear that these men were under the command of Sundowner. I surely do hope they were being compensated well for their services, like being paid in Trident gum or something, because Raiden was here to fuck and foreplay wasn't an option. Unlike the other stages we have tackled this challenge run, the beginning of this level was absolute cake, and I had no trouble snapping these goons in half just like I did the lips on my mechanical pencils in grade school. From here, it was time to make my way across the skyscraper terraces, and to no one's surprise, more enemies were introduced to the mix. As for the two s gurus over here, you better hope you're loaded with usables, because these things were serving up knuckle sandwiches for dinner and making sure that you took that shit to go. I have to say, I'm quite proud of myself for being consistently inconsistent when it comes to not only my horrendous upload schedule, but my performance in these challenge runs. Some resets I would run these two down, and then others take a hammer to the cranium within seconds. I attempted this far longer than the normal gamer would have, but as always, there was nothing a little kiting couldn't fix. I enjoyed the much welcomed relaxing gameplay as I completely snuck through the Washington subway system on my way to Galaxy News Radio, contemplated on whether or not that Fallout reference was a little too obscure to leave in the script, and then eviscerated the poor public highways the loyal Colorado taxpayers had graciously funded. I should point out that these basic enemies had effectively leveled up and seemed to now be able to take more of a beating. I could have used other means and methods to take them down, but that would take far too much effort just like making friends in real life. So instead, I stuck to the lazy route, aka beating them until they subsided. Either way, I sliced through the blood, sweat, and appendages of my enemies and eventually made it to our destination. Before hitting World Marshal HQ, Thick Stream Sam stopped by to open up Raiden's third brown eye. The bombshell that would literally rock his world and then also mine from the amount of pain it would cause me coming up here shortly. Troubled by the fact that Raiden had been murdering innocent civilians that were adopted as weapons, he was now no longer a card holding member at the Hot Boy Wholesales Club. Not only was my movement and attack speed cut down by a third, but there were enemies in between me and my objective. When I finally got there, I cursed the Nine because waiting for me at the front entrance of World Marshal HQ was was the bane of any no damage runs existence, another forced damage segment. Truth be told, I spent an ample amount of time trying to figure this one out, so at the cost of my own time, Detective Senza was off to attempt to crack this case. I first tried to tackle this hiccup by hitting it from different angles. Luring these gatekeepers into corners seemed to be a working strat until they wiped the floor with my face due to my slow attack speed. However, after trying different routes, that seemed to be the only option that got me somewhere, as brute forcing was far out of the question unless I wanted a mouthful of lead along with my skull f***ing. I know that this was nonsensical and brainless, but f*** you, I was already committed to this jail sentence. Some of you real ones look at your sub box daily, waiting for me to come back with milk like a deadbeat dad, so disappointing you all beyond measure on my return is the last thing I'd want to do. I spent around a day trying to figure this one out until I came across a video that solved this entire problem. One decade ago, this Sigma gamer here, Knock2 Live, saved this challenge run. There are fire extinguishers scattered around nearby that can be used to conceal Raiden from the incoming railing his aggressors plan to provide. If set up correctly, you could completely avoid taking any damage, but that is the hard part. The main reasons being the extinguishers getting reset back to their position every failed attempt and Raiden moving at a crippling pace. In my unmedicated state, I was somehow able to push 
push at this for nearly two hours or so without breaking, which actually came to me as a surprise. Once I had the rhythm down, figuring out the timing was our next step. Hitting them all at once didn't do the trick, and instead, I was forced to learn when I should hit each one separately, so I could be concealed for just the right amount of time. I eventually discovered that waiting 10 seconds after making one of the extinguishers go off was the G-spot I was looking for, and on the final extinguisher, I made a beeline for Sam. Did I just waste half a day trying to figure this out? Yeah. <laughs> I, I did, but the elation that came from actually pulling this off was unmatched. Come on, baby, I'm so close. I'm about to fucking blow. Yes! Woo! <laughs> Fuck yeah. It was now time for one of the coolest boss fights in this game, and that wasn't debatable. This was Monsoon, the man known for his extendo mag body and his trademarked Beyblades that he uses to let her rip on your prostate. The dialogue before Monsoon's fight is probably one of the driving factors for this game's recent success, and if you want a quick spark notes, I'll give it to you. Memes, the DNA of the soul. With Raiden's recent ego death, we could confidently say that this was a Category 7 shitstorm waiting to happen. How was Raiden going to get himself out of this situation? The answer may surprise you, and doctors hate him for this one simple trick. Raiden asked to have his pain inhibitors disabled, and thus Jack the Ripper was reborn, weaponizing his potent autism and anger to bring hell to all who oppose him. What I quickly learned from my first dozen resets was that Monsoon slapped, and he slapped hard. Throughout this fight, Ripper mode is active, which massively increases Raiden's damage, but doesn't increase my ability to be decent at this video game. So honestly, it just didn't matter. My strategy revolved around trying to get in as many hits as possible, and then prepare my thumbs for the ridiculous amount of blocking this fight contained. I swiftly learned that the most effective damage windows were after he was done wailing on me. Except for this attack here. This attack f***ing sucks and deserves to be flushed down the toilet for ruining half of my runs and making me master the backstep ability. With the tactics I had put together, a majority of my trouble was learning when to not get too greedy during my openings and surviving his serving size of about 5 spankings from the shadows. I was able to casually get to phase 2 without breaking a sweat and this was where things really started to get crazy. Okay. Wait, what? <laughs> what? Finally, I realized that destroying the helicopters specifically dropped EMP grenades. This was massive, because these things were goaded in terms of not only giving us breathing room, but the ability to get in freebie attacks. As long as you dodge Monsoon's Beyblades and barrage of scrap he throws at you, using the grenades will allow you to skip certain overwhelming damage sequences, which was a blessing. But after many, many failed attempts and nearly an hour and 23 minutes, I finally got him. Hey guys, script writer and editor Senza here to talk to you about something I didn't notice while recording this video. After re-watching the footage of me defeating Monsoon, all of my dopamine was Thanos snapped. Why? You may be asking. Because the no damage tag was missing on the mission complete screen. You could only imagine that after spending all of that time trying to take him down, my reaction to seeing this was equivalent to Kaiba's reaction when Yu-Gi-Oh used Exodia. Confused, I went on over to the cesspool that is the internet and quickly discovered that hitting restart on most of the boss fights without a checkpoint will ruin the chance to receive a no damage tag on mission complete as the game actually recorded the damage you took previously. Just to prove to you all that I know damage these fights, I will be posting the successful runs on my alt account. If you are interested in seeing them, then come back in a few days. I'll have a link in the description. Now, thanks for listening to my TED talk, and let's get back to slapping. Inside the World Marshal's headquarters, I was able to get past the front lobby by just looping my enemies around, and after doing so, I took an elevator to the 20th floor, where not a single one of my orifices were safe. Here, I spent around 20 minutes hacking and slashing until I came across the perfect run with my EMP grenades and ripper mode, and then scaled World Marshal by a method that is completely impossible by conventional means for anyone but Raiden. The effort Raiden was putting in to spank these vermin was worthy of compensation, but the job still wasn't finished. 
The latter half of this level was an interesting one. There is one section that deserves an honorable mention, because it actually involved me accessing 100% of my neurons, and that is the elevator sequence. If you aren't careful, the handful of enemies will do a good job at spreading your cheeks wide and going to town on an all-you-can-eat buffet. Getting through this involves focus and everything you have learned so far, making sure to block every attack and keeping ripper mode up at all times. Mercifully, the conductors of this ass rippage train give you a checkpoint in between poundings. I felt as though the second half of this sequence is harder, but I was starting to get fancy and efficient with my gameplay, and it also helped that I unlocked Monsoon Sai, which meant that I could bring them an Uber Eats delivery of my blade with genuine ease. Thanks to uncontrolled human engineering, this level ends in a boss rush against clones of Mistral and Monsoon. As opposed to when I last fought them, these clones seem to have a lower health pool and lacked different phases. But don't be deceived, they still had the ability to slap me around with a healthy amount of resets. In my first try, Mistral's clone experienced cruelty equivalent to what I experienced from the YouTube hierarchy whenever I say f come or but that easy victory royale didn't mean anything, because that was when I realized that I had to fight both of them consecutively without any checkpoints. What? No. I just spent two hours pounding my head against this guy, and now I gotta do it again? <laughs> no. It didn't matter if you flawlessly turned Mistral's nethers into a punched lasagna from a great run. One f up during Monsoon's fight would send me back to the beginning, and this was a problem, because I had 136 f ups during my first tussle with the Scourge of my past. That was another obscure reference, by the way. You're a real one if you caught it. Much to my surprise, I ended up squeezing a win out of this turbo spanking in under an hour. My final fight against Monsoon's clone literally had me trembling in my undies, over fear of missing a block. I'm not even lying either, I had to take a 20 minute break from the game just to calm my nerves. It turns out Great Value Mistral and Monsoon were actually guarding the brains of abducted children being virtually trained to become soldiers. Sundowner explained that this was Desperado's plan all along, and he let me know that he was creating these soldiers to sell as PMCs, or shadowing all over our ear holes that a war was on the rise. Sundowner made his way to the roof where Raiden confronted him once again. And not even five minutes later, we were here in another boss fight. Besides being blessed with this boner bop of a track, this fight was quite underwhelming, and Sundowner is in fact not invincible. Once his Amazon solar panel chastity belt was cracked, he became a punching bag, and not even his helicopter stood a chance. Within 23 resets, I disciplined this child like his parents should have, and it actually would have gone a lot smoother, around 16 resets smoother, if I didn't suck complete dog ass at blade mode. Other than that, I give this boss fight a sundowner out of 10. Pretty f***ing cool, and pleasantly easy for a no damage run. Upon his death, Sundowner warned us of an impending attack that would happen within the next three hours, and that attack carried out by Senator Armstrong would likely ignite World War III. With a little bit of quick maths, the squad deduced that it was going to take place in Pakistan, and Raiden made his way out of Marshall HQ to catch a flight there. Doc Tor picked me up in a heli, we quickly discovered that we were being pursued by the f***ing military, Raiden told Doc to trust him just like I trusted that 16 year old kid on YouTube to wrap my red ringed Xbox 360 in a towel to fix it, and then I made my way back through Colorado, on foot. Backtracking through this level was pretty nice, because this time the cock and ball torture was no longer being inflicted on me, and instead, we were the ones providing the treatment. Shout out to a very kind Colorado citizen for lending his bike to Raiden, and with transportation, we were now off on our way to catch a flight. Our drive would quickly be interrupted by Sam, who was nothing shy of an absolute gentleman for sparing me a speech and wanting to get straight into the action. This fight contained so much testosterone that a viewer not knowing anything about this game would probably pass this off as homoerotic. I'll tell you now, defeating Sundowner and getting through the streets of Colorado with ease had my endorphins pumping, which may have had a hand in my swift victory against Sam. It's quite difficult to overstate how much of an MVP Monsoon's weapon was in this 1v1. I actually have another MGR challenge run recorded where I tried to beat the game without a katana. This fight went totally different and was actually the hardest boss of that challenge run. 
Perhaps your eyes will one day be graced with that footage in the form of a 30 minute verbal shitpost. But until then, trust me when I tell you that not only did Monsoon's weapon dramatically change the outcome of my battle with Sam, but also made it bearable. I discovered within my first few tries that Sam's block timing was a bit slimmer than the other bosses. I dialed in, got my meat sack slid open a few times because I got a little too greedy, changed up my playstyle to be more patient, and in the end, I took him to Pound Town without taking any damage. Blade Wolf illustrated how much he cared for Sam as he made sure to retain his super cool katana in memory of him, and then we carried on to the airstrip to stop Armstrong. As always, this is Scriptwriter Senza here to tell you that I've rambled on far too much about this challenge, and the video is getting quite long. I know I say this nearly verbatim every crusade, and it's pretty much a tradition at this point, as I tend to vomit everything I think. But there are still two more bosses I have to school, and knowing you, you probably got a really hot date coming up soon. So I'm going to pick up the pace and throw some subway surfers up on the screen to keep my remaining Gen Z viewers interested. I was totally lying about that latter half, but that'd be pretty fucking funny. Alright team, let's finish this up. Raiden encountered a mouth-breathing Discord mod in the wild. We used a jet to assist us in our speed run to Pakistan. I probably missed out on a good pun revolving around that said jet, just like the missed opportunity to name diarrhea medicine gonorrhea. And then we made our way to confront Armstrong in the name of collateral damage. Welcome to the hottest vacation spot ever, literally, where it's common practice to have your spine ruptured by death robots and malignant tumors cosplaying as the average American are here trying to start World War III. This final level bent me over and paddled me down good. To emphasize, it took 41 recordings to beat this challenge, and 19 of them was on this level alone. So far, I was at 983 resets, and with the final two fights still coming up, we were on track to beat our Cyberpunk 2077 record of 1,224. With expectations tempered, I prepared myself for the excruciating torment I would endure by consuming a fruit roll-up and making my ASMR POV sandwich making OnlyFans exclusive video for my Patreon members. Make sure to check that one out if you haven't, I worked really hard on it. Trying not to be a lobotomized gamer here was a time-consuming process, the main hazard being the damn turrets that were here to turn us into Swiss cheese. Once I developed a strategy, and by strategy I mean giving up and just using stealth to get past my enemies, I made it to Armstrong to settle this once and for all. Raiden was now in the presence of the very first Elden Lord, Senator Armstrong, the man who grew up on a diet of steroids and democracy. We discussed memes, Our legacy lingers on. The memes. <laughs> they left us their it is too fucking good. good. I love this game, man. And then Armstrong decided that it was time for me to enter the cum zone and get folded into a fucking chair, which is probably one of the most American things he could ever do. Metal Gear Excelsis's fight was a little different from the other fights in this game, as blocking its attacks is impossible. It took me around a dozen tries to figure that one out, but once I did, I quickly resorted to backstepping, which gave me invincibility frames if timed correctly. A lot of its abilities are a free one-stop ticket to God, but as long as you get as far away as possible, beating Excelsis isn't too bad of a feat to tackle. With Excelsis destroyed by the hands of one of the greatest protagonists of all time, Armstrong decided it was time to go Super Saiyan 4 God Super Saiyan on my ass, which was a problem because that meant that we were bringing a sword to a fist fight. Given that this man had apparently turned into a fucking tank, trying to take him down was literally impossible, and he didn't appreciate my attempts in doing so. 19 tries later, I figured out that no damaging this encounter involved ignoring him completely. His AoE and grab attacks were a real problem, but in due course, the cutscene pops without you taking any damage, which was f***ing huge and had me so hyped that I shit my pants and came. Twice. Before the grand finale, I was graced with one of the greatest memes of all time, and then the senator decided that God Super Saiyan wasn't oh no. enough, and channeled his testosterone to go Ultra Instinct. Blade Wolf came in clutch with the sick assist, throwing me Sam's katana as Raiden had lost his, and it was time to finally answer the question you all came here for. If you'd like any tips for no damaging this fight, the only two I could give you is to make sure you're on 40 milligrams of Adderall and be ready to schedule several sessions of therapy afterwards because you're going to need it. 
Armstrong's insatiable appetite for my buns couldn't be quenched, and I quickly learned that within the first 30 seconds of this fight. He goes absolutely bonkers on you within a moment's notice, making no damaging this brawl a real pain. Favorably, his attack patterns seem to be telegraphed, but are completely random, so knowing when to run or simply backstep is a lot easier than it should be. It became incredibly apparent that around a third of his attacks should be blocked, a third should be backstepped, and the final third should be completely avoided using my terrain ticklers. Using this knowledge had me frothing out of the corners of my mouth because this was it. This was how I was going to beat him. Every minute that passed was torture, and honestly, I would have rather suffered an odd fate than doing this shit, like always farting when I came, or living a life with hot dogs for hands. Just when my morale was historically low, and I was going to give up on this challenge for the night, No, 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 my backstep, my, no, no, he was so low. He was so low. 208 resets later, I focused up and finally beat Armstrong, making that 1,346 checkpoint restarts for this entire challenge. Technically, the hardest no damage run I have done on this channel. Again, if you're interested in watching these fights go down, head on over to my second channel. And for those wondering, the answer is yes. You can beat Paddington Adventures in London as a pacifist. If you enjoyed the content, consider liking and subscribing so you can catch more of these shenanigans in the future. Thank you to the Diaper Booty Chairmen over on Patreon and YouTube for graciously funding these crusades, and thank you for taking time out of your day to spend it with a goober like me. It truly means the world. I'm not sure if you noticed, but this video and my next two videos will be experimental in terms of editing, because taking four months to post a single video isn't something I want to continue doing. I have more content on the way incredibly soon and until then, I love you fucks, stay safe, and make sure you wear your chapstick for the fall season coming up. Peace, love, and boners. <laughs> All right, my gamer orc brain needs a fucking break from that shit. Oh my god! They were spanking me. Ugh. It's a good fucking game though, god damn it. <laughs> I like it. Armstrong is so ridiculous, he's perfect. He's literally the perfect specimen. My God. <laughs> Literally, case in point, Armstrong is the perfect villain. He's the only villain that'll give you the beatdown of a fucking lifetime and then help you up when you switch sides and pat you down and be incredibly happy to make a new friend.